Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now it seems like it's been a while since I put together a budget gaming PC on this channel so today we'll be doing just that. I've tried to focus on low cost but capable as well as upgradable meaning that there is potential to upgrade should your budget increase in the future. This PC uses mostly used parts but the case I'm building inside of is new and costs just £30 on Amazon. For the money I was expecting it to be quite flimsy and while it's fairly lightweight overall, the construction feels sturdy given the price. This is the Hellcrack Classic MIDI PC case. It comes with a rear fan as well as soundproofing mats on each side panel. I like the fact that the PSU is bottom mounted inside this thing and that it's covered. This is something I usually look for in a case though it's less likely seen at the cheaper end of the market. It came with all the screws we need and the motherboard standoffs were already in place for a micro ATX board. I'm going to get the power supply installed in here first. This is an EVGA 600W W1 unit. I've used the 500W version of this in a lot of builds before, but this one gives us a little more wattage, and at £23 it was a solid used deal. A few marks and scratches where it's been removed from its old enclosure, but we won't see it anyway. I recommend buying a new PSU if you can, but the 12 month money back warranty the seller was offering with this one put my mind at ease. We're going to put the motherboard CPU and RAM combo together now, but first I'll remove the IO shield from its packaging and install this in the case as well. It's always good to get this in as soon as possible, as well as the motherboard mounting screws if your case doesn't have them in place already. As I said, this case also came with a rear fan, and if you've bought a case with a pre-installed rear fan as well, depending on where it's positioned, you might want to remove it before trying to get the motherboard I.O. shield and the motherboard itself in. It wasn't really in the way here, so I left mine alone. My motherboard is a Gigabyte B450MK, which I bought used, but it was described as not used, so just sort of open box. Everything was still packaged up as you saw by the IO shield and even the original heatsink brackets were in place. I'm going to remove these as we're using the stock Ryzen CPU cooler today which screws directly to the back plate on the other side of the motherboard. Now the board I'm using supports pretty much every AM4 processor out there up to and including the 5000 series so the upgrade potential is there. For my lower cost build I found a Ryzen 5 2600 for £40. These are basically the same price as standard 2600s here so I thought why not get the slightly faster X version. Make sure you keep an eye out for Ryzen 3600s as well because sometimes they don't cost much more. A quick lift of the latch lets us install this cheap 6 core chip and as for the thermal paste well there are millions of videos on the subject but a simple pea size amount in the middle of the CPU will do just fine every time. My Ryzen 2600 came with the stock cooler which was an unexpected surprise and we're going to install this next by screwing the four corners down into the aforementioned and included back plate. Don't forget to plug the cable into the CPU fan header. I do still occasionally forget to do this, I'm ashamed to say, so it's always worth the reminder. RAM next, and I tend to go for Corsair Vengeance LPX, reason being is that it's always worked for me and it's cheap, especially if you are lucky enough to win a matched pair in an online auction. Just £21 for 16 gigs of 3200 MHz on eBay. I have loads of this RAM just accumulating in the top drawer now, I'm not even sure if, if this pair in the B-roll here is the actual RAM that I bought for this video, but there we go. <laughs> Opening up the little clips at the end of each RAM slot and popping them into place with a gentle click is always satisfying and at this time I'd like to take a moment to apologise for my messy workspace. My house is currently a bit of a building site, there is stuff everywhere. Moving on and for the storage I'd suggest no less than one terabyte in 2023. Games are only getting bigger and once the operating system is installed you'll have even less room to play with. It's not uncommon for new releases to be around 100 gigabytes in size so the more storage you can afford the better. As our board has an M.2 slot, I went with this Kingston NV2 NVMe drive. This installs straight into the slot on the front of the board, so no extra SATA cables or connectors are needed. Two less cables to manage later on. 
With our motherboard, CPU, RAM and storage installed, it's time to put everything into the case. You might want to feed a few cables through from the back of the case before doing this, especially in a smaller enclosure like ours. I'm pulling the CPU power cable through a hole at the top as it will be more fiddly to do once the board is installed and screwed down. With that done, let's get the motherboard itself in place. Our standoffs are in already and so is our IO shield, so it's as simple as getting our board lined up correctly and then screwing it down. Micro ATX boards usually have six screw holes and said screws will be included with a new case as well as other fixings of various sizes. No need to screw the board down too tightly. I've made that mistake before and ended up rounding off the screw back in the days when I first started building PCs. With a board fastened in place, I'm going to plug in the rear system fan to the fan header and then plug in the four plus four pin CPU power connector into the corresponding connection. I'm also going to pull the 20 plus four pin power connector through from the back as well and plug this in. Cable management inside this cheap case is pretty much taking care of itself. The only other things we need to worry about plugging in now are the USB audio and front panel connectors that are attached to the case's front panel. Little cables like this can be daunting to a first time PC builder, but everything is usually labelled. Furthermore, your motherboard's included documentation will tell you where to plug stuff in and failing that, the motherboard's webpage will likely have a PDF available to download. Filming this part is always awkward, so I've skipped forward a little bit, but as you can see, our cables are all plugged into their respective headers, including the audio, USB and front panel cables, which control things like reset and power buttons, as well as any LEDs. Almost done now, and as you can see, things are looking pretty neat. Around the back, things aren't as tidy, but a couple of cable ties will neaten this up. I won't do that today. I tend to leave things loose as I'm always swapping parts about, but even so, this is far from the messiest system I've put together. I've tucked the unused cables into our unused hard drive bay around the back, apart from this one, which we'll need next. This is the graphics card power cable. After feeding this through to the front of the case, I slid the rear panel back on, as we don't need to tinker behind here anymore. As you can see, it's still looking pretty neat, so let's get our graphics card installed. Here's what I've gone with. It's an ASUS ROG GTX 1060, one of my favourite models around. It's really quiet when gaming and should just about fit in our small case. At least I hope so. Don't forget to remove any necessary PCIe slot covers, I did this earlier. The slot covers in this case can be removed with a gentle wiggle rather than screws, but there is an aluminium guard at the top here that does unscrew, which will hold the card in place once it's in. It's going to be a tight fit for the 1060, but nothing too cramped. There's still room to install a couple of fans at the front of the PC case as well, later on if we want to, though we do only have two fan headers with this budget board. After securing the 1060 in place, the last thing to do is connect the 8 pin power cable and once that's done, we're ready to go. Now I think this build looks pretty good, the case itself is really nice for the money as well and with the components in here, it feels even more sturdy. Now it's up to you what operating system you install but for the purpose of the benchmarks, I've gone with Windows 10, so how does this cheap setup handle itself? Now this PC definitely had budget and upgradability in mind, build it cheap now and save room for potential upgrades later. We could stick a 5800X 3D in here if we wanted to, as well as upgrade our GPU. Our first game tested today is Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered at 1080p with a medium preset and with the help of FSR, this machine can run some of the more demanding games like Spider-Man but it is best suited to those esports and less intensive titles. Here we were seeing 73 FPS with a 1% low of 47 and a 0.1% low of 38. Hogwarts Legacy up next and this is a fairly new and fairly demanding title as well with a medium preset once again and FSR 2 set to quality. We were just about averaging 60 although our percentile lows do suffer in and around the busier areas which is often my experience with this game and a wide range of hardware. Grand Theft Auto 5 is the perfect example of a game that will run really nicely on a system like this. Here with the high settings, soft shadows and FXAA with advanced graphics off, we were seeing 97 FPS with respectable percentile lows of 70 and 63 respectively. 
CSGO is a perfect game to play on a PC like this. Our 2600X will allow a 283 FPS average, though there will be the occasional dip and drop here and there. Now this occurred when I got wiped out by other players, so if you're a better player than me, then your experience will be a lot more consistent, to say the least. Even titles like Cyberpunk will run, but again, we'll need help from FSR here. We have the high crowds, high textures, and the low preset for an average of 50 FPS. In and around those busier areas, we will see a few dips and drops. The 2600X can struggle in some more CPU intensive games, but swap this out for a 5600X later down the line, and well, you'll see a massive boost in CPU performance. For Forza Horizon 5, this is a very well optimised title and with the high preset and TAA, well it runs perfectly on our system. 67 FPS on average with barely any hiccups to report. Apex Legends now with the lowest settings, TSAA enabled and the high textures just to sharpen everything up a bit. 105 FPS here with respectable 1.1% and lows of 72 and 53, a more than playable experience. Finally, we have Fortnite at 1080p with a medium preset, 100% resolution scaling and TAA. Here the average was 88 and our percentile lows of 45 and 27 were also respectable too. Considering that Fortnite can prove problematic in terms of that 0.1% figure, with a lot of hardware that I test. It did okay here. Overall then, this is a PC that doesn't cost too much to build, but it's one that also has somewhat of an upgrade path as well. And that's really why I put this one together. I hope you've enjoyed this one. I just wanted to put a PC together, to be honest, after quite a while of not doing so. And I hope you enjoyed the video, regardless of what you think of the setup itself. If you did, leave a like on it, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.